Greetings and welcome. We are in uh, room 303, Senior English B, and we are now with you on page 758, 759, and Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley's Frankenstein, more particularly an introduction to Frankenstein. Now, I've already given a lecture that kind of summarizes Shelley's novel Frankenstein. What we're going to be looking at now is the project from your anthology that tries to help prepare you for the reading of the novel itself. And because that's the case, this will help you then as you go forward to read the entire novel. Obviously, you're not going to have any of the actual novel here in the anthology. Let's start on 758 and connecting to the essential question. Readers of Gothic literature, like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, were looking for suspense and thrills. Let's write it down. Gothic literature, we're going to come back to that term and to be here in a moment. As you read, identify some of the dark, mysterious images Shelley describes. Finding such images will help you to answer the essential question, what is the relationship of the writer to tradition? Now, I'm working with you at 2B. Let's write this down under literary analysis information. The novel Frankenstein is a classic example of Gothic literature. Write that term down. It's an important one. A subgenre of literature that takes the reader from the reasoned order of the everyday world into the dark world of the supernatural. So in other words, Gothic literature is going to be very interested in the supernatural. By the way, you might jot down already at 3A, if you, were in, if you can remember in your junior year when we did um, um, Edgar Allan Poe, the American author, for example, The Fall of the House of Usher, classic example as well of the American Gothic tradition. Gothic literature, back to your reading on 758. Gothic literature, popular in the late 18th century and early 19th century, is set in dark castles or towers or in other places with a disquieting, mysterious atmosphere. As you read, note Gothic characteristics in Shelley's work. The popularity of this form was due in part to the new romantic movement in literature. And of course, we are studying the romantics, and so it makes sense to write down now that word romantic movement in literature. Romantics rejected two central beliefs of the 18th century Enlightenment. That reason is the most important human faculty, and that its application can fully explain the world. So in other words, romantics definitely thought that the heart was more important than the head, right? and that there were all kinds of mysteries of the world you never could understand. That's what we mean when we talk about romanticism, right? Instead, romantics put their faith in imagination and in the, and the healing powers of nature. They viewed imagination in the following terms. This is important. The romantic idea of imagination, you've got two bullet points here. Let's make sure they're in your notes at 2B. Creative force comparable to that of nature. The imagination. It's, it's a creative force. Also, it's the fundamental source of morality and truth, enabling people to sympathize with others and to picture the world. As you read, notice how Shelley's account of the creative process reflects the high value the romantics placed on imagination. What Shelley is going to do in this reading, and it's quite fascinating to read it, is she's going to tell us where her idea for the novel Frankenstein actually came from. Okay? Reading strategy. Preparing to read complex texts. Involved readers naturally try to make predictions or reasoned guesses about what will happen next in a literary work. As you read, use text features such as titles, background notes, side notes, clues in the text, and your background knowledge to make and confirm predictions. Employ a chart like the one to the right. Good idea. Read the good idea at level one as you're reading. Notice the six vocabulary words at the bottom of 758. I hope they're in your notes as well. You'll definitely see them on the exam, and obviously they'll help us with our reading. Let's go ahead now and get some background information on Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Note your dates, 1797 to 1851, right? Okay. The author of Frankenstein. Let's read together, 759. Writing was in Mary Shelley's blood. Her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, who died at Mary's birth, wrote one of the first feminist books ever published, A Vindication of the Rights of Women. Her father, William Godwin, was a leading reformer, author, and political philosopher. Four years after his wife's death, Godwin married a widow, <coughs> Mary Jane Claremont, whom his daughter grew to resent bitterly. It was agreed that to ease the situation in the tense household, the girl, now 14, would go live in, du uh, in Dunby, Scotland, at the home of William Baxter, her father's friend. After two years in Scotland, she returned. Upon her return, Mary Shelley, then still named Godwin, 
met her future husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley. So let's write this down. Mary Shelley is going to, is going to marry, no pun intended, Percy Bysshe Shelley, the great romantic poet. He was a radical young poet who had become William Godwin's admirer. Mary, only 16, fell in love with Shelley, and the two ran away together to the continent and later married. So write this down. Mary Shelley will marry uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley when she's very young, and they run away together. Eventually, the couple settled in Italy, where they li lived blissfully for an all-too-short time. Their great friend Lord Byron also lived in Italy. Within a few years, the Shelley suffered the death of two of their children. Then in 1822, only eight years after Mary Shelley had first met him, Percy Shelley drowned. His death left the 24-year-old Shelley and their two-year-old son, and their, and their two son penniless. After Percy's death, Mary returned to England where she continued writing to support herself and her son. She produced several other novels, including The Last Man in 1826, a tale of, great, of a great plague that destroys the human race. At the age of 48, Shelley became an invalid and she died six years later of a brain tumor. Let's now turn to page 760, Introduction to Frankenstein, and let's read the background information. In Greek mythology, Prometheus was one of the Titans, a race of giants who were said to have existed before humans and who engaged the gods in battle. Later myths say Prometheus created the first human beings. During the Romantic era, Prometheus drew renewed attention. Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote a first play about Prometheus entitled Prometheus Unbound. The complete title of Mary Shelley's novel about a doctor who attempts to create man is called Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. And in another lecture, I've already outlined kind of what that all means and why Shelley would maybe call her novel as subtitled The Modern Prometheus. Well, we want to turn now uh, to this uh, selection. We'll be uh, listening to a professional reader read it for us. And as you read along, pay attention to the following. We're going to be looking at the nature, you want to write this down, at level 2A. The nature of a writer's inspiration. Where do great ideas come from? Of course, the subject here, obviously, all the, all the way back to ancient Greece, we were asking this question. In this introduction, Shelley offers readers first-hand insight into the process of writing and the creative process itself. As you read along, just pay attention to the reading, and we are looking to try and get some insight into what made Shelley write Frankenstein. Let's write this down at level one. It's the easiest question to answer as you read along. All you got to do is bullet point the answer to this question. Why did Shelley write the novel Frankenstein? What made her want to write this novel? She's now going to tell us. Let's read along and just pay attention now. Again, work with trying to follow along with every word. All right, here we go. Introduction to Frankenstein by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. In this introduction to the third edition of Frankenstein, published in 1831, Mary Shelley recalls the circumstances that led her to write the novel during the summer of 1816. Let's write that down. Summer of 1816. The publishers of the standard novels, in selecting Frankenstein for one of their series, expressed a wish that I should furnish them with some account of the origin of the story. I am the more willing to comply because I shall thus give a general answer to the question so very frequently asked me, how I, then a young girl, came to think of and to dilate upon so very hideous an idea. It is true that I am very averse to bringing myself forward in print, but as my account will only appear as an appendage to a former production, and as it will be confined to such topics as have connection with my authorship alone, I can scarcely accuse myself of a personal intrusion. In the summer of 1816, we visited Switzerland and became the neighbors of Lord Byron. At first, we spent our pleasant hours on the lake or wandering on its shores. And Lord Byron, who was writing the third canto of Child Harold, was the only one among us who put his thoughts upon paper. These, as he brought them successively to us, clothed in all the light and harmony of poetry, 
seemed to stamp as divine the glories of heaven and earth, whose influences we partook with him. But it proved a wet, ungenial summer, and incessant rain often confined us for days to the house. Some volumes of ghost stories, translated from the German into French, fell into our hands. There was the history of the inconstant lover, who, when he thought to clasp the bride to whom he had pledged his vows, found himself in the arms of the pale ghost of her whom he had deserted. There was the tale of the sinful founder of his race, whose miserable doom it was to bestow the kiss of death on all the younger sons of his fated house, just when they reached the age of promise. His gigantic, shadowy form, clothed like the ghost in Hamlet, in complete armour, but with the beaver up, was seen at midnight by the moon's fitful beams to advance slowly along the gloomy avenue. The shape was lost beneath the shadow of the castle walls, but soon a gate swung back, a step was heard, the door of the chamber opened, and he advanced to the couch of the blooming youths cradled in healthy sleep. Eternal sorrow sat upon his face as he bent down and kissed the foreheads of the boys, who from that hour withered like flowers snapped upon the stalk. I have not seen these stories since then, but their incidents are as fresh in my mind as if I had read them yesterday. Top of 762. We will each write a ghost story, said Lord Byron, and his proposition was acceded to. There were four of us. The noble author began a tale, a fragment of which he printed at the end of his poem of Mazeppa. Shelley, more apt to embody ideas and sentiments in the radiance of brilliant imagery, and in the music of the most melodious verse that adorns our language, than to invent the machinery of a story, commenced one founded on the experiences of his early life. Poor Polidori had some terrible idea about a skull-headed lady who was so punished for peeping through a keyhole. What to see, I forget. Something very shocking and wrong, of course. But when she was reduced to a worse condition than the renowned Tom of Coventry, he did not know what to do with her, and was obliged to dispatch her to the tomb of the Capulets, the only place for which she was fitted. The illustrious poets also, annoyed by the platitude of prose, speedily relinquished their uncongenial task. I busied myself to think of a story, a story to rival those which had excited us to this task, one which would speak to the mysterious fears of our nature and awaken thrilling horror, one to make the reader dread to look round, to curdle the blood and quicken the beatings of the heart. If I did not accomplish these things, my ghost story would be unworthy of its name. I thought and pondered vainly. I felt that blank incapability of invention which is the greatest misery of authorship when dull nothing replies to our anxious invocations. Have you thought of a story? I was asked each morning. And each morning I was forced to reply with a mortifying negative. Many and long were the conversations between Lord Byron and Shelley, to which I was a devout but nearly silent listener. During one of these, various philosophical doctrines were discussed, and among others, the nature of the principle of life, and whether there was any probability of its ever being discovered and communicated. They talked of the experiments of Dr. Darwin. I speak not of what the doctor really did, or said that he did, but, as more to my purpose, of what was then spoken of as having been done by him, who preserved a piece of vermicelli in a glass case, till by some extraordinary means it began to move with voluntary motion. Not thus, after all, would life be given. Perhaps a corpse would be reanimated. Galvanism had given token of such things. Perhaps the component parts of a creature might be manufactured, brought together, and endued with vital warmth. Top of 763. Night waned upon this talk, and even the witching hour had gone by before we retired to rest. When I placed my head on my pillow, I did not sleep, nor could I be said to think. My imagination, unbidden, possessed and guided me 
gifting the successive images that arose in my mind with a vividness far beyond the usual bounds of reverie. I saw, with shut eyes but acute mental vision, I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out, and then, on the working of some powerful engine, show signs of life and stir with an uneasy, half-vital motion. Frightful must it be, for supremely frightful would be the effect of any human endeavour to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. His success would terrify the artist. He would rush away from his odious handiwork, horror-stricken. He would hope that, left to itself, the slight spark of life which he had communicated would fade that this thing which had received such imperfect animation would subside into dead matter, and he might sleep in the belief that the silence of the grave would quench forever the transient existence of the hideous corpse which he had looked upon as the cradle of life. He sleeps, but he is awakened. He opens his eyes. Behold, the horrid thing stands at his bedside, opening his curtains and looking on him with yellow, watery, but speculative eyes. I opened mine in terror. The idea so possessed my mind that a thrill of fear ran through me, and I wished to exchange the ghastly image of my fancy for the realities around. I see them still, the very room, the dark parquet, the closed shutters, with the moonlight struggling through and the sense I had that the glassy lake and white high alps were beyond. I could not so easily get rid of my hideous phantom. Still it haunted me. I must try to think of something else. I recurred to my ghost story, my tiresome, unlucky ghost story. Oh, if I could only contrive one which would frighten my reader as I myself had been frightened that night. Top of page 764. Swift as light and as cheering was the idea that broke in upon me. I have found it. What terrified me will terrify others, and I need only describe the spectre which had haunted my midnight pillow. On the morrow, I announced that I had thought of a story. I began that day with the words, It was on a dreary night of November, making only a transcript of the grim terrors of my waking dream. At first, I thought but of a few pages, of a short tale, but Shelley urged me to develop the idea at greater length. I certainly did not owe the suggestion of one incident, nor scarcely of one train of feeling to my husband, and yet, but for his incitement, it would never have taken the form in which it was presented to the world. From this declaration, I must accept the preface. As far as I can recollect, it was entirely written by him. And now, once again, I bid my hideous progeny go forth and prosper. I have an affection for it, for it was the offspring of happy days, when death and grief were but words which found no true echo in my heart. Its several pages speak of many a walk, many a drive, and many a conversation when I was not alone and my companion was one who, in this world, I shall never see more. But this is for myself. My readers have nothing to do with these associations. Now let's turn and do a quick annotation of this really amazing little statement by Mary Shelley about where she gets her ideas for the novel Frankenstein. I want to go back to the very beginning here, and let's just work through this now rather quickly at level one. Notice she begins by telling us some information about when all this occurred. We are in the summer of 1816 in Switzerland, and you have an amazing gathering of people there. You have Shelley, who is a young girl of 18 at the time, 19, 18, 19 years old. You have her guy, Percy Bysshe Shelley, who's already a pretty well-known poet. And then, of course, the most famous of the gathering is the poet, romantic poet, Lord Byron. And then you have a guy named Polidori there as well, who's a friend of Byron's, right? 
And they all are kind of sitting together reading ghost stories. Now, let's just pause for a moment and write this at 2A. Many writers have said that if you want to be a good writer, you have to be a good reader. And so notice here, inspiration to write the novel Frankenstein comes from other stories being read. Notice that you have some sidebar information here. Um, Elizabeth McCracken, I'm on page 761, a scholar says the following, Mary Shelley turned 19 in the summer of 1816, and while I do think I hope that writers get better as they get older, there's also the fact that you can only write your first novel once, that the mix of ambition and fear and yes, youth may make it more exciting and fully realized than the books you write when you know what you're doing. Ghost stories are the place that we begin. Let's go over to page 762. And the idea here about each then the challenge. So let's write it down. If first they were reading ghost stories, then there came this challenge. Everybody needs to write a ghost story. Let's try and see who can scare the wits out of everybody else in the group. Okay. Again, Elizabeth McCracken with another scholar's insight on 762 says, A good ghost story stays in your head forever. I've never gotten over a book of New England ghost stories I had as a child, including one story about a man who buried his murder victim at the base of a tree only to find that the next year's apples all had a clout of blood in the center of them. A fun little story. Let's jot down really quickly at 3A. What is your favorite ghost story? What is your favorite scary story? Or do we even today believe in ghost stories in the same way? Are there movies that intentionally you enjoy just because they scare you, they freak you out? What is for you your favorite one like that? On page 762, just to continue back um, at, at, uh, at level one, notice the second major paragraph. She says, I set about to try and think of a story, which does ask a really interesting question in 2A. Where does the inspiration for creation come from to think of a story? How do you know what you're going to write before you write it? Notice 